Hi, everyone. Hi, welcome back to another episode of Door to Door. I'm Virginia Stanley, joined by my colleagues, Lainey Mays. Hello. And Essie Ramirez. Greetings, everyone. And we are joined by two amazing, wonderful, lovely, brilliant women who are going to talk for a few seconds now, and then we'll put one of them in the virtual green, green room. We have Nancy Pearl. You all know Nancy Pearl, everyone's librarian, every favorite, everyone's favorite librarian, writer, director. I don't know, Nancy, there's nothing that you can't, you wear many hats, <laughs> but we're thrilled to have you here to talk about the paperback edition of your book, The Writer's Library, which is just so wonderful. And Pung Shepherd, uh, whose debut the Book of M uh, blew everyone's hair back. And we'll talk about that one for, uh, for a hot second. And then uh, we're gonna talk about Pung's forthcoming book, uh, uh, The Cartographers, which is coming out in March. So um, we'll, we'll start talking with Pung in a second and uh, Nancy will go into the virtual green room. But I just wanted to thank you both so much for coming on and taking the time to speak with us and to librarians about books. That's what we're all about. Nancy, all the books, all the authors, all the people you spoke to, and the books that inspired them to be, that ultimately played a huge role in those people becoming writers. And Pung, you're um, taking the readers by storm. Your second book is off to a great start already. As I say, it's not even, uh, it's not even out yet, and it's already receiving wonderful reviews. So um, anyway, hello to both of you. Hey. It's great to be here. It's great to be with you, you guys again. Lovely to see you. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing Pung talk about her book. Um, and then, and of course, spending that time in the green room by myself, I can meditate. <laughs> <laughs> we got you in the Do you have anything to read? Um, uh, yes, I do actually, but it's not a Harper book. <laughs> well then, <first. laughs> unless, it's, unless it's the Moffats. It's not the Moffats, but I could run, go get the Moffats that's, if that's you true. want. Um, so Pung and Nancy just met each other virtually just now. So it's nice to introduce you to each other. And um, it's just, it's always fun to just listen to your conversations. Where do you live? Where are you, you know, where are you going now? What are you reading? That sort of thing. So Pung, if there's anything you want to say before we put Nancy, I was going to say put Nancy away. But put <laughs> <laughs> I would like to ask Pung what she's reading. What I'm reading. Um, I actually just finished, um, I just finished a book that comes out in February. I was blurbing it. It's called The Violence by Delilah S. Dawson. Um, incredible. It's very, it's about um, another kind of plague, but um, yeah. it, so it was just really interesting to read it at kind of a, you know, during these COVID times. And then I've started another one called The End, I think it's called The End of the World House or something like that by Adrian. I'll look it up before the end of this. Um, yeah. yeah. It's set, um, it's set in the Louvre. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um. Somebody, you get trapped in a time loop in the Louvre or something like that. That's, um, nice. I just started. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Oh, I just finished um, really a wonderful novel called Still Life by uh -huh. Sarah Winman. I, I mean, it, I, it's a book. I mean, I think you could one could read a lot of books on um, digitally. You know, I read a mm -hmm. lot of books digitally, but some books just demand to be read holding and and um, and that book Still Life. I mean, beginning uh, with the cover yeah. and just, you know, just gorgeous. It, it's not deckled edges, which I would always love to have, but, <laughs> um, but it is a gorgeous book book and, and so wonderful, really a wonderful novel. Hmm. Nice. Well, that's a, that's a good place to uh, start our conversation, I think. So, um, Nancy, I guess we'll say goodbye to you for a little while. Okay. We'll come back and talk to you about the Writer's Library. Okay. And um, Pung, we'll start with you right now. Sounds good. Okay. So, uh, well, congratulations, Pung. Um, you're, Thank you. You're, yeah. I mean, we had you on at the uh, Public Library Association Conference in Philadelphia. I don't even know how many years ago that was, Lainey. Do you know? 
probably you do. I do not. My first Four. one. So 20, I think it's 2018. 2018 when the book yeah. event came out. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about, can you talk about that book a second before we get into the cartographers, your new book that's out in March? Uh, sure. Because your debut just, you just hit the ground running. Um, and um, I thought it would be kind of neat to, um, to talk about that book for a bit, because it, as I say, it just, um, you know, it won the, it just received so many accolades. It was, you know, best book here and best book there. And um, I have my notes here. Uh, Amazon best book of the year, L best book of the year, Refinery, The Today Show, NPR on Point. It went on and on. Uh, you were hailed by authors, including Paul Tremblay, David Lipsky, Darren Strauss, Christopher Brown. This was your debut. I can't imagine how heady that was for you. Um, so can you talk a little bit about uh, the book of M before we just, just briefly, and then I would like to get into the cartographers. Yeah, I am. Um, well, I, uh, I mean, I still kind of can't believe it that, um, I mean, that, um, you know, that it found readers that loved it and that it, it had the reception that it did because it was, um, it was a really interesting process trying to find an editor for it because when my agent sent it out, um, we got a lot of, um, editors were really confused by it, but we sent it to some science fiction and fantasy editors and they would say, well, there's, there's not like enough magic. It's not weird enough. And then we sent it to a bunch of literary editors and they were like, well, it's got too much magic and it's too weird. And, uh, it was, it was really, um, you know, it was my first book. So I was scared. I was terrified that it wasn't going to find a home anyway. Um, but it was a really, uh, nerve wracking process to find a home for it. And then when it finally landed at William Morrow uh, with my editor, Emily there, uh, I just felt like she, you know, she understood that it wasn't really about the magic or about, um, you know, whether or not it was literary, it was just about the love story at mm. the center of it. And she, I felt like she really got it that it was about the people and the emotions. Um, and then I, but I sort of feel like a lot of books like that, sometimes the more trouble they have finding a home to begin with, sometimes that just means readers might connect with them, connect with it more because it's, um, you know, it's, it, it's unique in some way. And so yep. hopefully it's unique in the right way. And I, I, um, I hope that the book of M was unique in the right way. I think it was, I know it was. <laughs> uh, it's, it's scratched an itch and it satisfied so many readers on so many different levels. There's a great quote from, um, Library Journal, uh, Shepard has crafted an engaging and twisty tale about memory's impact on who or what we become for aficionados of literary dystopian fiction such as Emily St. John Mandel Station 11 or those who enjoy stories of cross country travel. I mean, nice comp. Yeah. Um, so anyway, folks, if you haven't read the book of M, you must, uh, because as I say, uh, it, it just, uh, if you go on Pung site, which is terrific, by the way, you'll mm. see all of the praise uh, and all of the love for that book. And now four years later, here we are again with a new book, um, The Cartographers, which as I said before, is already receiving um, great raves. I love this one by Brad Thor, um, who says, Peng, Peng Shepherd has done it again. The Cartographers is an exquisitely written, brilliantly plotted, absolutely fantastic novel. Look at that jacket, okay. <laughs> Let's get into it. Okay, Pung, what do you want everybody to know about this book? Um, I, well, it's uh, The Cartographers is, um, it's a novel about map making, obviously, and uh, family secrets, I would say. Um, the, the story follows uh, the main character is Nell Young, who discovers after the death of her scholar father, Dr. Daniel Young, um, that a seemingly worthless map in his belongings actually holds an incredible deadly mystery and she sets out to uncover what both this map and her late father have been hiding for decades. Yeah, there's a there's a lovely quote here from Charles Sewell who wrote the Oracle Year. That was another book that was sort of like- Oh, I love that book. That? Yeah. yeah, yeah. and he's been to ALA and he's just lovely. And I loved his quote where he says, it's a story about magical maps that lead to your heart's desire, the sort of people who would do anything to find them and the joy, regret, and possibility they bring. A vastly rich experience. I love this book. Um, 
it, this is um, an ode to art and science, history and magic. It's um, it's a it's imaginative story about ancient craft and places still undiscovered. What made you write it? Uh, I mean, I, I just I love maps. Who doesn't love maps? Um, <clears throat> you know, every time I, I feel like every person, if you're passing by somewhere, you know, like on a city street and there's a there's a, a tourist map, you know, posted there or you're in a library and there's a, a book of maps and just nobody can resist stopping and looking at it for even just a second whether or not you are totally unfamiliar with the place that it's depicting or you're actually intimately familiar because you always feel like you're going to find something you know something new or something you didn't know before when you look at it and um i just wanted to i just wanted to write a story about that feeling that there's always something that you you didn't know would be there that you're going to discover on a map. Right. So now speaking of maps, we have a couple that you've picked out that we want to we want to show. Yeah. Right? And then I think we need to talk about the New York Public Library. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Say. Where Lainey is right yeah. now. Yes. <laughs> Um, so this this map actually uh, the two maps that that I sent you that we're going to show they're in the novel itself um, because they are two other maps that Nell the main character ends up discovering in her investigation of why the map that she's found in her father's belongings is so important and this one is a map from uh, I think 1910 it's a Sanborn fire insurance map they used to draw these to help firefighters figure out. Um, what buildings were made of and how quickly they would burn and how difficult it would be to insure it or not. And right there in the on the left side, that big brown thing is the New York Public Library. And in the novel, there's a secret hidden in the New York Public Library. And uh, I won't say what it is yet, but Nell doesn't know that at the time, but she finds this map and she has to figure out why, what the secret is on this one and how it relates to the other map in her father's belongings. Okay, pretty neat. Yeah. Oh, and then this one is the, uh, this is the seemingly worthless map in her father's belongings. It's, it's a gas station highway map of uh, New York state. And um, they used to, uh, they didn't even sell these. They used to just give them away for free. I think at the counter of a gas station, if you would stop in and, um, and so, you know, she can't figure out why this map that cost nothing decades ago and is now out of date, obviously, because it's, you know, 70 or 80 years old, um, could cause, um, you know, so much mystery and so much danger. Very intriguing. <laughs> Seeing Long Island, Long Island highlighted there. Mm. Um, okay, so um, before we get to some comments and questions, um, I think you were going to read a little bit. Yes, I can. Yeah. Um, okay. I just cool. got I just got my arc um, about oh. a week ago. Yeah, and then um, yeah, and then I was asked to do this event. And I thought, well, good. I'm so glad that I got them. They are just being printed. Do you? How um, do you feel about the the jacket? Oh, I love it. Um, we went through it. It was a really interesting process to get the cover done because you know, my editor and I were talking and she was like, what do you think should be on the cover? And we both said, well, a map, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out that actually it's really hard to make a good book cover with a map on it. It's really, it just ends up looking like a nonfiction textbook or like an atlas or something like that. And we just couldn't convey that it was a novel, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so we went for bookshelves like at the library and I just, I love it. I think it's so gorgeous. You I like all the that... little, sorry. Go ahead, Lainey. Yeah. I was going to say you could, be into a, another realm and say books yeah. are a map of life. Yeah. <laughs> there yeah. you go. It's a map. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. In a way. Um, okay. So I'll just read something really quick um, from the very beginning of the book. I think all you need to know is that um, Nell uh, used to be a scholar like her father at the New York Public Library, but they had a bad falling out and he actually fired her about seven or eight years ago before the novel starts. So they have never, they haven't spoken since and they have a very bad relationship. And then she finds out on page one that he has just died. And so she has to go to the library, um, you know, to speak with police and kind of gather his things up. And so she's just, you know, gotten there and, and done this thing. Uh, and then the police and the director of the library say, we'll, we'll give you a minute, you look a little, uh, you know, we'll let you have a minute of privacy. Uh, <clears throat> 
The library's back offices swirled quietly around Nell as she sat huddled on the edge of her father's desk next to the mess strewn across it. Librarians were finally getting back to work in their cubicles, turning on their computers and shuffling through their mail. And past the staff door, patrons were browsing the stacks and choosing seats at, ran at reading tables, clicking on lamps and pulling out notebooks and flipping pages. Children were running through aisles and sneaking around the lobby. Taxis were pulling up and dropping off passengers outside. Nell tried to think of all of it out there and nothing in here. Gradually, she realized her hand was resting on the corner of the desk where the hidden lock was. Ever dramatic, her father had long ago built a secret compartment into his desk that only he and she knew about. He kept especially valuable maps inside while working on them for security's sake, he'd said even though the New York Public Library had never been robbed in the history of its existence. But when Nell was young, and he'd been a slightly gentler version of himself, he'd also hidden little notes in there, hidden little notes to her in there as well. And she would reply with childish drawings of maps she'd copied or created herself. All Nell had to do was push her index finger forward a little bit. The dullest, quietest thud told her the compartment had opened. Slowly, without moving anything but her hand, she reached inside. There was only one thing in there this time, a slim leather bound shape, not a book, but a leather portfolio. She moved her fingers another subtle inch, feeling the familiar texture. It was the leather portfolio, she was certain. The one that had originally belonged to her mother before she died, and Nell's father had taken to using it as a way to remember her. As a child, the portfolio had held almost magical power to Nell. She used to watch her father slip it into and out of his briefcase when he went to work at the library or came home in the evening, trying to imagine what beautiful maps could lay inside. There were other maps he brought home too, but those came in clear plastic sleeves or cardboard folders. Only the most valuable, the most rare of them, were carried in the leather portfolio. Nell wondered at all of the priceless maps she must have laid eyes on as a small girl. Long after she and her father had stopped talking, she had sometimes thought of the portfolio, about the things he still carried inside it. And now here it was, hidden in the mess. The police officer was still at the door beside his partner, the two of them giving instructions to the rest of the employees in the corridor. And the director of the library was over at the bookcase, plucking tissues gently out of the box to bring back to Nell. For a split second, no one was looking at her. Before she could think about what a huge mistake it would be, how much trouble it could get her into. Nell slipped the portfolio out from the compartment and into her tote bag in one smooth motion and returned her hand to the top of the desk. You know, it's gonna be a good adventure. <laughs> so there's like a secret compartment. Yeah. Like I'm always here for that. Um, I have to say reading the book, NYPL was like its own character, which I love so yeah. much. And I live in New York and I've, it made me like, why am I not there right now? <laughs> so why did you pick the NYPL specifically? Like, is it, was it just because of the math department or just because you, you love the library? Why? And, and I guess a two-part question, why that? And shifts you like research on, on the maps part. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I, well, I chose the New York public library, um, because first of all, because they do have the, um, the, the huge map division they've got, um, I think, it's something like over half a million maps in there. And um, it's, it's free and open to the public. You can go in and you can request, you know, any, you can take them out and, you know, look through them and touch them and, and, um, and, and see as many as you want. And it's really such an incredible, um, you know, research room that they have. And um, I used to go into it. So I uh, used to live in New York and am back all the time. And so I used to go in that room a lot and just <laughs> marvel at things because it, um, you know, they really have so many incredible um, maps and atlases. And um, it really felt like, um, you know, the reading room was one place and it's beautiful and really, really special. I mean, there's, there's nothing like it, but I would often sit in the reading room and think about, um, as amazing as the reading room was, it was probably even more amazing behind the doors where I couldn't go, where they have all of the other, you know. Uh, and so I wanted to write about that, about this vast, um, you know, like the vast shelves and archives on in the back of the library that most patrons don't go to see and what kind of secrets could really be there. Um, 
Okay. Essie, did you have a question? I did, actually. Well, it wasn't so much a question as much. I was just hoping you would explain the story that inspired you to write this book the, with the Phantom Settlements. I heard, yeah. I, I love that uh, inspiration so much. I was just hoping you could talk about it a little. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there is this, um, it's a practice, or it, it used to be a practice. It's sort of fallen out of um, out of use now that technology has become so much more advanced. But for many uh, decades, there was this kind of secret practice among cartographers um, of uh, basically inventing small, they would put an error in their map, but it's it would be on purpose. Um, and they would call those those error those intentional errors are called phantom settlements and basically they would use these intentional secret errors as copyright traps or copyright protection basically because um because all all maps are supposed to be very accurate it's really hard to prove that somebody's copied your work and not just done their own if their map is accurate and your map is also accurate because they're both just accurate uh, and so map makers, I don't, we don't really know who, who came up with this idea, but if you, if you hid an error in your map, uh, then if the error showed up on someone else's map, you would be able to prove that they had copied your map because if they had done the research themselves, there's no way that that error could have shown up on their map because it's not actually a real place. It's not a real street that you've hidden there. It's not a real mountain. It's not a real town. Um, and so, this, um, you know, it's kind of a genius strategy. And it turns out that every once in a while, uh, people do get caught because you can, um, you know, there's some people do copy other maps and then these places turn up and, and they go, you know, they can go to court and they can um, prove that there's been copyright infringement. But the book is based on um, something, it, it's based on an event that happened uh, in, uh, I think it was in the 1920s. There was a small, um, a very small company that was making these highway gas station maps. And they were worried that bigger companies like Rand McNally or HM Boucher, who were um, still doing more like beautiful giant maps or atlases, um, they wanted to get in on the gas station map uh, corner of the market. And so they were worried that these bigger companies were gonna copy their work so they could catch up. And so they planted a very tiny town in the middle of New York state. And it's on that map that we just saw. And they named it after themselves. They just picked their, they scrambled their initials and they, they put it in the middle of nowhere and they, they didn't tell anybody. And then about a year later, uh, one of their competitors, this you know, really big uh, company came out with its version of a gas station map. And they looked and they saw that made up town on, on their competitor's map. And so they got ready to sue and they, you know, called their lawyers and they said, we can prove that you've copied our map because this town doesn't exist and it's on your map. And Red McNally said, actually it does exist. And so uh, those two, the two small time map makers and their lawyer, they got a photographer with them and they drove out to the area in the middle of the nowhere where this town shouldn't, you know, it was just supposed to be a dirt intersection. Uh, and they were gonna take pictures of it and say, nothing is here. But when they got there, there, there was an entire town and there was also an official record in Delaware County administration logs. And there were, I mean, there were like, there were buildings, there were people living here. There was a gas station. There was like a, you know, a boat rental place, like a fishing lodge. And, um, and they just, they had no idea. And it was named the same thing that they had named it on their map before anything existed. And so that, um, there's more to that story and I don't want to spoil anything in the book, but uh, when I came across that, I, I read about that years ago, I think in like 2012 or something. And it was just such an incredible, mysterious, you know, like how could this have, ha how could this have happened? Uh, and so I had been researching it ever since for years. And then uh, slowly the idea for this novel came and, but that, that was the original inspiration. I love that story. <laughs> I thought that was so great. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. We have um, so many questions. <laughs> so many questions. So little time. We'll get to as many as we can. Okay. And um, Pong, I know you're not on Facebook, but we'll send the questions to you um, if we can't get to the answers. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Lots of love for the book. Can't wait to read it. 
Um, let's see. Okay, we'll go in order. They can't wait to read it. Love the sound of the characters. Um, I think we, uh, did you have to do a lot of research before writing this book? Asks Carla Sudo. Uh, um, I did end up doing a lot of research, but I like to do it at the same time. Um, because I feel like it's really, it's, it's very easy to go into research hole and then just never stop researching. And so I like to write. And then when I come to something that I need to know, I figure that one thing out and then I keep going because okay. it's just so, you know, fascinating. You just never stop with this research. <laughs> Uh, Susan Ravi wants to know how long had Nell been estranged from her father? I think it's seven years before the first page. Okay. Uh, Lainey, you want to ask the next couple and then Essie the next couple? Get yeah. Kelly Moore's question here. Kelly's, <clears throat> Kelly Moore's question is great. Did any librarians help you at NYPL with any research? Oh, um, yes. I don't remember that. I was mostly in the map division, so it would have been um, it would have been um, librarians in the map division. Yeah. yeah, very cool. We might need we need to like email someone the map division. Make I sure know. I need to. I should have had. The, I should have the names here. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> very cool. Um, let's see. This ooh, discussion questions. I'm not sure. We will get back to you guys. Maybe for the paperback. Yeah. But Regardless, um, they didn't make a great book, uh, a, a great book for book clubs. Amy yeah. White talking about discussion questions, but yeah, yeah we paperback. are we are supposed to be doing those very soon. Uh, my editor and I, yeah, Good. for the paperback yeah. or for this. Uh, we were, we'll see. <laughs> I guess okay. we'll see how quickly. <laughs> yeah, um, she's on maternity leave right now, so okay. Yeah. Um. So this sounds so good. How challenging was it to write your second novel after such a successful debut from Maureen Roberts? Oh, uh, um, well, thank you. I think I think it was always going to be hard because second novels were just so hard. Um, and I, it was also the pandemic, so that made that made things difficult. But um, it, I, I found it really difficult for this way because um, it so much of the story is based on true history and so I and I wanted to stay as faithful to that as I could and so that that was a, a new thing that I had to learn how to do was tell a really compelling story while also keeping historical facts straight okay there was a question someone asked about the intentional errors and uh, I think Lainey or Essie must have answered it that they're called phantom settlements mm -hmm. yeah so that's the answer for uh it was susan riley who wanted to know what those were called um and essie i think there's a question here from casey davis very end it says have you have you read the map of salt and stars by zane oh i'm so sorry uh Jacques, jacquard um it is actually in my tbr pile i'm really excited for it yeah okay good we got to the questions. Oh my God. Yay, like wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get much faster. <laughs> Love that. Um, like a lightning round. Yeah, it was a lightning one round. Yeah. Um, there, I have one more. Okay. You have, you've lived in so many different places and you've like traveled all over. How has that impacted your writing? How has that affected it? Um, I think it, um, I don't know. I mean, I hope that I draw, um, you know, different things from all from the places I've been. I think um, for this book, especially, I, I went back and I was looking at a lot of maps of a lot of the places that I had been. And um, it really helped me remember kind of how special maps are because even for places I've been, I would still see things on these maps that I didn't remember I had walked past or that I need to go to next time. And it just kind of refreshed my, my sense of wonder for cartography. That was really nice. That's awesome. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, we're it's it's uh, December, January, February, March. So three months, March fifteenth. Yeah. The, the cartographers goes on sale. So exciting. Um, yes. And uh, we're 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 so happy for you. We're so you know this is just it's so much excitement here from librarians. Very much looking forward to reading the book, and um, we're so glad that. You were able to um, to talk with everyone for a bit about this book. Lots of research and um, just a just a cool cool tale about uh, family secrets. 
and mm -hmm. uh, told with the, the New York Public Library maps at its center and yeah. a really great protagonist. So thank you so much, Bong. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Yes. Good to see yeah. you again. Yeah, great good to, to see, see you. you. Yes, yeah. be well. Thank you again. And librarians, pick up uh, Book of M if you haven't. And then the cartographers, that is available So uh, in e-galley form. So treat yourselves. Pong, yeah. take good care. And Thank you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, let's bring Nancy back. Oh, she is lovely. She really is. Yeah, that I could hear. I want to go to the map room now. That's what I, I know. Do. We should go for a field trip. Let's go for a field trip. Mask up, off to the map room. Hi, Hi Nancy. Nancy. Hello, Virginia. Hello, Lainey. <laughs> it's great to have you back. Thank you. Um, yes, Punk Shepherd. She's so cool. I know. Yeah. The book sounds great. I have it on my Kindle to read um, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. She is I was thinking absolutely. she'd be a great interview for the Book Lust with Nancy Pearl show. Wow. The well, TV show. That would be lovely. She's just, well, you saw, she's just great. So smart. Um, so yeah, well, I know a person that can put you in touch with her. I know we'll make that happen, right? That happen. Okay. Here we go, Nancy Pearl. Nancy Pearl, so excited to have you here. I'm sorry I don't have the paperback of the Writer's Library, but I still have my beautiful hardcover. And we have the Jack, oh my God. There's That's the paperback. So beautiful and we can sh we can share it online. <clears throat> Absolutely beautiful. The Writer's Library, the, the authors you love on the books that change their lives. By Nancy <laughs> Pearl, Jeff Schwager. And with a wonderful introduction, a beautiful introduction by Susan Orlean. So we're very grateful to her for, for writing that, that gorgeous introduction. It is just such a, all right. So let, we'll talk about the book in a second, but for the, okay. for the two people out there in the, in, the app, in the stratosphere who don't know who you are, let me fill you in on Nancy Pearl, queen of everything. <laughs> <laughs> queen of your heart, Virginia. What'd you say? I said, I'm queen of your heart as you are. You queen are queen of my heart. Good God, yes. go back a long way, don't we, Nancy? Yes. I'm very lucky to have you in my life. I um, all right, veteran librarian, check, as we all know, worked in public library systems in Detroit, Tulsa, and most recently Seattle, where you were the executive director of the Washington Center for the Book. Uh, you were a longtime PW columnist and creator of the One City, One Book, otherwise known as if all of Seattle read the same book, which I still love, Nancy. I you, love all of Seattle read the same book. Well, you were there at the very beginning. You were there with the very first one with our dear Russell Banks. I know it, it was like one of those moments in my life that I'll never forget. It was just dreamlike, yeah, you know, yeah. coolest pretty, thing. Pretty wonderful. It was, and it's all thanks to you. You came up with this idea. What if all of what if all of Seattle read the same book? Next thing you know, there's this Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Foundation. There's all the stuff that happens, and it's a thing. And buttons and posters and buses and everybody is the city is just covered in 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 excitement um, and promotion for this. I mean, that was just such a wonderful. The book was The Sweet Hair After by Russell Banks. We had. Um, performers who were reading the characters on the radio. Yep. I think guess the week before, I can't remember, leading yep. up to his arrival. Yep. And you know who one of those readers was who went on to great, um, uh, to, to have a great Hollywood career is Anna Ferris. Are you kidding me? I didn't kidding. know Anna Ferris. Yeah. That's crazy. Yep. Wow. Yep. You know, she's a local, a local oh. Seattle area girl. And no her father idea. at that time was, I think, president of the Library Foundation. So we were, we had a little in with her. So that was wonderful. That's a fun I, fact. That, yes. I did not know that. I've only recently caught on to the whole mom phenomenon, by the way. And if you haven't you. seen mom, trust me, you don't know what you're missing. I totally missed it when it was all, you know, running the first time around. And now I'll, I'll get up at four o'clock in the morning and watch that show. And I laugh, laugh, laugh. All right. Anyway. <laughs> Um, okay. Author, Book Lust, Book Lust with Nancy Pearl, uh, your, your show on Seattle Channel, best-selling author, literary critic, 
uh, George and Lizzie, though we did not publish that novel. I love George and Lizzie. If you haven't read George and Lizzie, do, because it is such a great story. I just love those, those characters, Nancy. I love that book so much, and I'm not just saying that. All right, we could go on, but we have to get to the yes. writer's story. Yes, yes. Uh, the authors you love on the books that change their lives. And here it is, and again, this is the hardcover, which came out last year. The paperback came out uh, just this past month, November. Um, and, uh, but wait, just one second, please. Before we get to this, before we talk about the book, there is one more thing I would like to mention, Nancy Pearl. Yes. And that you were recently the recipient of the National Book Foundation's 2021 Literary and Award for Outstanding Service to the American Literary Community. This was presented to you at the National Book Awards last month. Congratulations to you, my friend, for receiving this honor. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much. You know, I dedicated the award. I'm the, uh, the as I said in my acceptance speech, I'm the first librarian to win this award. And I dedicated it to all the librarians who have who, who have done such stalwart work um, since the beginning of librarianship, but, you know, especially through these difficult pandemic days. And, um, and the great work that they do in putting people together with books and promoting reading and, and adapt, adopting and adapting the If All Seattle Read the Same Books to their community. And I love reading about those, those programs. And, um, you know, I became a librarian because of a librarian. And, um, and uh, you know, there's gonna be a picture book about me in next August published uh, called Library Girl, which is about my childhood library and me riding my bicycle to it. So um, yeah, so, you know, I'm a librarian born and bred. Can you show us your award? Yes. Do you Look happen to it. have it there? I happen to have it right next to me on my desk. Look at this. That is absolutely beautiful. Congratulations to you. Thank you. That is so well-deserved. And for everything that you've done, the ripple effect of all the work that you have done. And I watched your acceptance speech and uh, was dewy-eyed because you, what, exactly what you did was thank librarians and mention your, your librarian when you were young. And, and I mean, I think about all of the librarians watching now, and of course you, and the effect that you've had on readers you know, and and so I guess now that's a good way to funnel yes. this this conversation into the writers' library because this is a, not a profile so much of the authors as well it is, but I mean it's really the books that influence them and shape them. And so I um, I love 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 this book because you really sort of your the wide range of of authors that you and Jeff interviewed um, and I found it really fascinating for, for lots of reasons I, just to sort of you know peel back the curtain and and, and see what what made writers um, what sparked them you know and uh, and and that there's this wonderful reading list in the back so that all these books that have that they they pulled out the many, many books that they pulled out that influenced them are right there. Um, um, and I love the line drawings that head each chapter. Everything about the book is just so beautiful. So I wanna talk about that and then I wanna talk about the audio book. So can you, can you talk a little bit about your experience with, with the book? And, and if you even wanna talk about you know, what's happened since writing that book. I mean, it was the yeah. best time for that to be published, but I think right. <laughs> Right. Um, so I think the best part of the book, certainly the most enjoyable part for, for both me and Jeff, was that we did these interviews for the most part in the homes of the authors. So we went to Maine and interviewed Richard Ford in his little writer's cabin. We went to Saratoga Springs and interviewed um, uh, uh, Russell Banks. We, we flew to Minneapolis and interviewed Louise Erdrich, um, not in her home, but in her bookstore, Birchbark Books in Minneapolis. Um, we went to California twice um, 
uh, twice or three times to sort of do the, the uh, to make sure we could do the authors that we wanted so much to do. And one of the interviews that many people uh, have said is, is their favorite interview in the book is the interview with Michael Chabon and his wife, Ayala Waldman in their home in, um, in, in Berkeley and uh, sitting around their dining room table, they're eating peanut butter and banana sandwiches and we're all drinking tea. They did offer us peanut butter and banana sandwiches, which happens to be my favorite sandwich. Um, but we, Jeff and I had already eaten before we came. So we were all drinking tea and just watching Ayala and Michael talk about books and, and um, especially in that interview, particularly we got into a lot of children's books, Michael, did a lot of reading out loud to his four children. And so we just shared our love of, of children's books. We interviewed um, Siri Hustvet um, in Brooklyn on what must have been the hottest day of the summer of 2019, I think. Um, and, you know, she, her books are so just um, the blazing world, I think, is my favorite of her books. And just talking to her. And, and after every interview, Jeff and I would just like, like we would walk out and and just like look at each other and say oh my god there's so much here um and it was really to i think reading the, these interviews you see the author in a different way these authors because you don't see them we're not talking about their books we're talking about the books they've loved and when you talk about the books that you love you're talking about your life and so there it's a wonderful it's a wonderful sort of way of getting to know um, uh, Leila Lalami or Maza Mengista or, oh my gosh, um, um, you know, all of these, uh, Dave Eggers. I remember Joe, uh, Joe, my husband, he wasn't at this interview. Jeff <laughs> and I left the interview with, um, uh, with Dave Eggers, who was also a literary and um, had, had say, yeah. the same award. Um, and mm. we, and I, we left and just, you know, Jeff, Jeff and I said, gosh, we need to start referring to him as Saint Dave. I mean, he su does such good work for the community that oh. for the, you know, Berkeley community. Um, uh, um, uh, the, the person who wrote less, Andrew Sean Greer, uh, interviewing him uh, and meeting his his pug and his husband, and I mean, I, you know, it just was a way of feeling feeling that these writers. I, it, it was just really gave us a different view of these writers. And I think that's what we, you know, we wanted to talk about how important reading was to them and how important, you know, what books meant the most to them, both as writers, but also as people, um, as, as readers. So that, that, that's been so great. Were there any surprises, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah. were there, or were there any books that you, and I can't even imagine this happening to you, but were there any books that you're like, I've never heard of that book, or did that not happen? Yes, but I think the biggest surprise was um, how many people, how many of the writers talked about how much they loved Watership Down, how important Richard Adams' Watership Down was to them, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not even talk, I'm not even saying, I mean, these are not writers. It's everyone from you know, Madeline Miller, um, author of Circe and Song of Achilles. We had a wonderful interview with her in her Philadelphia um, mainline home um, and with her two little girls, one of whom just wasn't interested in wearing clothes at that time. So, and, and, uh, and, and the, when we said goodbye, the, the little girls came downstairs to say goodbye to us. And one of, one of them looked at me and she said, you're old, aren't you? Um, and I said, well, yeah, I am. And she said, I could tell by your hair. So of course that made me want to just go out and like, you know, like, should I get rid of all this gray? But I thought, <laughs> oh my God, I love those little girls. And Madeline, and I remember, um, and I, when Madeline told us this was her favorite book, I said, oh, and look, I see it on your bookshelf. 
And she said, oh, no, no. She said, that's the copy that I lend to people. She said, my own copy is upstairs next to my bed. So, you know, it's still an important book to her. And I love the idea that you have an extra copy of a book that you use to, to sort of proselytize about the book. Um, and Madeline Miller read that book, uh, Watership Down, as in, in the spirit in which Homer would have written it, that it was, a, you know, it was a, a story of heroism and, and you know, um, all, all of that. I loved, I loved the way different people read the same book differently. Um, Siri Husbett talked about a children's book, uh, 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 and she and I agreed, just one of the most eerie, weird children's book called The Lonely Doll. Oh my gosh, you've got to go. Look. It's just, I remember reading that as a children's librarian. I didn't read it as a child. And it just terrified me, even as an adult. It was so bizarre. It's written by a woman named Dare Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. And Siri talked about that in her interview. Um, so just all these unusual that I mean, we knew Michael Chabon was a great fan of science fiction, but then to have him talk about um, the Amber series of books by Roger Zelazny, um, a, a series that I had loved as well. You know, when somebody loves the same books you love, you feel so close to them, Miss Virginia. You know that's for a fact because you and I both loved Baby Island. Baby Island, the best. I think it's I think it's the one book that you and I have both fallen on the sword for together. Yes, We've fallen on the same sword, Nancy. Yes, right, right. We shared the sword. Yeah, we yeah. loved that but, book. That but I, I and I remember you were saying that. I remember saying that you know when you when you find somebody who loves a book that you love, um, there's a connection there. Um, and I and I, I I also love. I just wrote this down. And you said when you're talking about the books when you talk about the books you love you're talking about your life and that's really so true it really yep, does yep. is defining in, in many ways and you know that librarians are in this this very interesting position of you know they're not therapists they're not trained as social workers but people when you're helping somebody find a good book to read for them and mm -hmm. they're telling you the kind of books that they like or what's going on in their life, they're sharing so many personal things with you. It's very humbling, you know, when somebody says, I'm just, I can't read depressing books now because, you know, my sister is whatever, um, or this isn't the right time for a book that that's that, that's that heavy, I want something lighter. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just that sharing what other there's no other profession besides those helping professions that that get that that ability to learn about other people, which is why I think that customer service, as we would call it, you know, um, that that's the best for me that and talking about books or meeting people and talking about books is was always the best part of being a librarian working on the public service desk learning people's stories even though they don't know they're telling you their stories that's very interesting they don't know that they're telling you but they are and it's an important thing i mean it, it is a very it obviously takes someone who is well read is really listening and then um and then taking that person by the hand and taking a chance. And then it's an important role that you have. And you obviously take it very seriously as most librarians do. Um, Nancy, and do you have a comfort read? Do you have like a book if yes. someone's like, I well, can't read that right now? Yeah, so my comfort reads are um, Georgette Hayer and a recent comfort read who I am embarrassed to say, I just really started reading her during the pandemic, so that she was a 2020 read, um, is Angela Thurkel. Um, so, you know, very, uh, very sort of Barbara Pym-ish, mm. but even, even happier than Barbara Pym. So, you know, I was just reading some descriptions of books and 
and so one was described as, you know, this brings back the gruesome serial killer from blah, 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 blah. And I thought, well, that's a book you're not going to get me anywhere near. I'm not interested in gruesome serial killers. Unless I can direct who they can murder, then I might be interested. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> you are so funny. Um, <laughs> I will say that I, I follow Nancy on, on Twitter and uh, Facebook and Nancy, Nancy wrote about the Moffats, which I have to admit, I had not read, nor frankly had I heard of the Moffats. What do I know? But then I went out and bought them all in the Astoria bookshop. And, um, and they're just, they, they have the best illustrations, Nancy. They're yeah. so sweet. They are so wonderful. But Nancy said in particular, everyone needs to read, here I am shilling other, you know, other publishers' books and so what. It's Rufus M. And Nancy, why do, why do people need to read this first chapter? Well, because in that first chapter, so these are set in the 30s and 40s in, um, I think it's Cranberry, New Jersey. Somebody's gonna, I know, write to me and tell me I'm wrong. But um, <laughs> in the first chapter of Rufus M, Rufus, goes to apply for a library card and what he goes through to get that library card and his determination he's just a little boy he's just learned to write his name and he has to do that it's it's just it, it, it's such a heartwarming chapter and you know Eleanor Estes is the person who wrote the hundred dresses as well um, and uh, which is probably one of my one of the best books about bullying um, that you can share with a child. Good to know. Um, okay, now I would like to. We have lots of questions, and I want to get to them. But I, before we do, I I would like to talk a bit about your um, the audio book and also yeah. your website, which has. Can we show that first, you guys? the link that shows those individual, each chapter begins with a beautiful line drawing of the author you're interviewing. So um, I love this, your site. And if you just scroll up, these are wonderful PW starred review. I'll get to those in a sec, but these are so wonderful. Jennifer Egan, there's, there's a wonderful quote from each one of these authors, Ayelet Waldman and Donna Tart and uh, Madeline Miller. They're so wonderful. So do yourselves a favor. Life is too short for bad books, says Michael Shabon. Uh, great illustrations, great quotes, um, and can all be found uh, on Nancy's book. And more importantly, they can be found in the book. Nancy's website and the book, even better. Um, and now I would like to talk for a second about the audio book. So um, can you talk a little bit about um, how you and Jeff uh, you know, sort of launched the audio book because I think, and we have a couple of clips we'll, we'll play for you and then we'll get to okay. questions. Um, so, so very briefly, Jeff and I, um, we were the readers for the introduction and the separate introductions for each of the authors. Several of the authors wanted to do their, in, to read their interviews themselves for the audio book, which was great. And the, uh, for the other ones, the authors who didn't want to do that, then we, um, then um, Harper got uh, professional audio book readers to do those. Um, so, so uh, and of course we tape, we recorded it during the pandemic. So Jeff and I couldn't be in the studio together. We both had to make separate trips in to to do the the um, our own recordings, but it was great. It was um, it was such an interesting way to do it. I'm Jeff and I are very grateful to Harper for um, having the uh, for working with us to put together a book that was very complicated to do. Well, so and as you say, there are. Um narrators and then there are a few authors who read the answers themselves you post yes. questions and right. they their answer richard ford um luis alberto urea Lori frankel so um and i think a few others but maybe we could play we just have a little clip of madeline miller so that's that's an example of the question and the answer by the narrator and then we'll play venda levita who answered her own question so here we go 
Madeline Miller After spending a couple of days in the constant bustle of New York, we boarded a train at Penn Station for Philadelphia, and 90 minutes later were in the comfortable suburbia where Madeline Miller lives with her husband Nat and their two young daughters. Their home in Narberth is just steps away from the fabled Pennsylvania main line, on a street so quaint and quiet it could have been transplanted straight out of the 1950s. No one would guess that behind the front door of one of the stately homes, a young mother was writing some of the most subversive feminist fiction on the bestseller lists to her guests. Guests. And then we pick it up. Did you grow up in a reading family? I did. My mother in particular. She was a librarian and an English major, and there were books all over the house. We had these huge built-in bookshelves, and I pretty much read my way through them. Many of those books were wildly inappropriate for me to read, but I didn't know. It was all information. I was like, just keep reading. So yeah, I read everything we had in the house. And my graduation present at the end of every year was that we would go and have a big book binge at a bookstore. I would get to buy a set number of books for the summer that I would then read through in a week. But it was very exciting. And then we'd do the library for the rest. You remember? And then, uh, so that's an example of um, Madeline Miller's answers, read by a narrator. And then we have Venda Levita, who answered in her own voice. So it's, um, you want to play that one real quick? We talked to Vendela at Book Passage, a Corta Madera bookstore not far from her home. At our request, she brought along a pile of her favorite books to show us, and we talked at length about her associations with each of them. Were you a reader growing up? Yes, I was. My father started an art and antique gallery in the Mission District near where he grew up. He was really into antique furniture. One day when I was around 10, he brought this really old bookshelf home from the gallery. It was an enormous bookshelf. My parents still have it near their entranceway, in part because it's heavy and impossible to move. And then the only problem was once he brought the bookshelf home, he had to fill it, and he couldn't fill it with paperbacks or books with ugly covers. So he and I went on a couple of scavenger hunts to estate sales to find books that would look appropriate in it. We found boxes of old books. The dustier, the better. The older, the better. And... When we filled it in, the bookshelf looked beautiful. And then I started reading all the books we'd acquired. They weren't curated in any special way. They weren't bought because of the title or the author. They were purchased purely for aesthetics. One of the first books I read was Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maugham. He made a big impression on me, although sometimes I wonder how much of it was just based on how much I liked the name Somerset. I thought that was a great name. The other book I loved was a collection of Hemingway stories and it became a point of reference for me and my father. I would read the books in our bookshelf. He would read the books. My sister, who was five years younger, would read the books. And it was kind of an accidentally well-curated library. Such a great, yeah, intimate, you know, we're all invited into, the, into, the, into their homes, into their, their hearts because yeah. of you. Yeah. yeah, that was wonderful talking to Vendela there. And seeing that bookstore, which I had never been to, Book Passage is a famous, very well-known California um, bookstore. But now, you know, whenever I think about her, I see that enormous, in my mind, I see that enormous um, bookshelf that's still in her parents' home filled with books. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, we have lots of questions and comments, so we're going to get to those now, okay? Sure. Okay. Um, so the audio version, Vicki Nesting says the audio version of the writer's library was wonderful. Um, let's Thank see. You, so many questions. I'm scrolling all the way back up here. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Let's see. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, sending much love to my dear friend, Nancy Pearl says Susan Riley. Vicki oh. Nesting loves the new paperback cover. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Susan Riley loved George and Lizzie. She reviewed it for our in-country publication. 
Um, Kelly Moore says, loves I became a librarian because of a librarian. Me too, says Kelly. So much love, so much, uh, just so much love here for you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Susan, Susan Riley says, the lonely doll was one of my favorites as a child. <laughs> Kelly Moore says, I love Nancy's Doorways essays that I came across recently on her Twitter account and it is in the chat room for folks to see. Do you want to mention, do you want to talk about that? Um, you know, my theory about read, Reader's Advisory, which, you know, I have done a lot of uh, speaking about that, doing workshops for libraries all over the country and the world, actually, um, you know, it's just a, a way of trying to understand why people like the books they like. And then the corollary, of course, is how to help them find more books. So, and I'd love to do that workshop some more. There, you know, we had to put paid to it during, during the pandemic, but I'm hoping I can do more again. Okay. Okay. Now, Janet Lockhart has a question, then I'll let Lainey and Essie um, pull out some more questions here. But I, I love this question because I know what your answer is. I think. Janet Lockhart says, I would like to know if Nancy has mastered the fine art of putting down a book she's not enjoying. If so, any pointers for folks struggling to learn that skill? Well, Janet, very nice of you to ask because there is um, what is what's called Nancy Pearl's Rule of 50, which happens to be on um, Starbucks uh, a venti cup it's number 69 during the series that they did with quotes from authors so basically if you're 50 years and under as laney and ser um give a book 50 pages and then at the bottom of page and virginia is too and then at the bottom of page 50 ask yourself do i you know am i really enjoying this book if you are of course go on and read more if all you care about is who marries whom or who the murderer is um, turn to the last page. You know, there's lots that our government knows about us, but they don't know that we have skipped the whole last half of the book um, to find out, you know, what happens at the very end. So go for that. If you're 51 and up, um, subtract your age from 100 and that number, which gets smaller every year, is because time really get goes faster and there's less time and ever more books um that that's the number of pages you should read um and before you can guiltlessly give up and guiltlessly is i think a key word then when we turn 100 we can legitimately judge a book by its cover <laughs> i love that that's great advice <laughs> oh, i'm gonna employ that in my my daily life Definitely. I think you should, Lainey. Yes. I well, you should. I'm gonna just quote you if anyone asks. They're like, well, <laughs> I, I, the law, it's the law. <laughs> right. Um, there's another question by Vicki Nesting. She asks, Nancy, you mentioned all the books on your Kindle. Do you still buy print books and how to decide which ones you want in print? I do buy print books. Um, th there's a, a, a there's a British publisher called Dean Street Press, and uh, they're associated with the Furrowed Middle Brow Press, which I think is the best title ever. And they have re reprinted um, mysteries, but most and other types of books, non-genre books as well. But many women writers reprinted many women writers from you know the from the middle half of the 20th century. Well the beginning, that first half of the 20th century. And I have been and they're just lovely books. And of course it's my beloved Angela Thurkle is available from them, but also writers that I didn't know. Um, uh, so those though I have been buying those mostly I buy books that I really want on my bookshelf because not even so that I, that I know I'm going to reread them, but because I just couldn't imagine being in a in a house that didn't have those books there. You know, um, old, very much older titles. You know, I'm never going to reread probably the Beanie Malone books, which were a teenage series that I read when I was well. I think when I was a teenager, maybe a little bit later, but 
I just loved them so much. I just wanted those books on my bookshelf and they take up a lot of space. There's like 13 of them. So that's a lot of space, but I just couldn't imagine not having them available. So those are the books that I buy, the books that, um, like I just bought a copy of um, a mystery called Claire DeWitt and the City of the Dead by Sarah Gran, which I think is one of the best mysteries ever, ever written. And I, and I bought a copy um, because it it just it just doesn't it just it you know I think I read it first from the library and I wanted to own a copy and so that's the kind of books I buy. You know I remember reading an interview with Laura Littman and uh, she loved the Beanie Malone series. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. So weird how that's the stuff sticks in your head. Um, everybody's loving your theory, your, your rule, actually, it is a rule. Yes. And, um, I think, uh, Virginia, did you not read the Beanie Malone books? I did not. I because, read the Betsy books. Yeah. So well, the, Beanie, everything... so the Beanie Malone books are about, um, a Catholic family in Denver and, um, they begin with the end of, you know, set in the, in the late forties through the early 60s. So you meet Beanie as like a, a, maybe a freshman in high school and it ends up where she's married and has children and you know kind of progresses through there. But um, it, it, they're just a lovely, there's one, there's a, in every series, there's always one sad book, you know, sad for various reasons. In the Betsy books, it's Betsy was a junior is the hardest, is painful because that was a hard year for Betsy. And in the Beanie Malone books, there's one of those that's a very hard year for Beanie. Um, yeah, so people, yeah. yeah. You know, my, my mother worked in the, in, the, in the, she wasn't a librarian, but she worked in the, in the library at, at a school, at an elementary school. She used to bring these books home all the time. And that's, you know, Encyclopedia Brown, devouring those things, remember those? And yep. Karen Hayward and all those wonderful books. I just uh, loved them. But, yep. You know. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. I think we have gotten to the questions. I, um, you know, if we have a couple more seconds, if you, and we do, because we can do whatever we want. <laughs> um, would you just tell the story about um, Russell Banks? When Wait. Russell Banks was in school. And oh, he was yes, yes, for his own good. I love that story. Yes. So this is a story that Russell told us when we were interviewing him that that when he was in in when he was like in he was a he he did not have a particularly happy childhood. There was a lot of upheaval and he wasn't the best behaved kid in school. In fact, he would probably say he was one of the worst behaved kids in school. And in any case, his fourth grade teacher, whose name he still remembers, said to him, Russell, you don't need to come to class. What I want you to do is I'm going to give you this huge piece of plywood on, um, you know, outside in the hall. And I want you to build a map with everything about Brazil in it. And, you know, and here was Russell, who's so he spent that whole, I mean, what a smart teacher, yep. you know, um, to do that. And, and that's one of the ways that Russell, first of all, got interested in Brazil, um, that, that an interest that's kept through his adult, his mm -hmm. adult life, but also it's a way that he learned about, you know, the information you can get from books and, and, and how that can be applied to the real life. But I just, again, have this picture of this little boy, you know, unable to go into the classroom because he's such a disruptive kid, just spending this half a year building this three-dimensional map of yeah. Brazil. I love I, that. I do too. I yeah. do too. And, you know, I don't think he's ever shared that. I think this interview is probably the, the one interview, you know, because it would only come up if you ask kind of specific questions, like, right. you know, when did you, when did you start to love to read? Right, right. But, and also, you know, you and Russell share a very special bond, I would say, you know, from yes. way back when um, with the the sweetheart after and, and right. the community I read. But yeah, I just, I just love that story. And it, it breaks, breaks my heart a little bit, but it also makes right. me think he was almost too smart for his own good. And wow, what a cool teacher. Yes. It's like, 
Okay. I know you're smart and you're totally bored. Yeah. And his characters, you know, rule of the bone, you know, the the characters in his novels, you can see where they came from because once you know that little boy, right. Not that they're autobiographical, you know, they're not auto fiction in any way, shape or form, but every, I think that when you write a novel, you put yourself in it one way or another. Yeah. And I, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that um, I love Rule of the Bone. That kid, so catcher in the rye esque in a weird way. I mean, he's just, oh, you know, and you feel for him, you know, right. and, and there's just so much going on there with that boy. But um, that's what makes Russell Banks so wonderful. And what's the, what's the name of the book? Um, I always forget the name that's about a homeless, two, a homeless kid um, living under. That's oh. Yeah. Um, well, uh, besides rule, well, we're all librarians, so we we we're while we're not we might not be digital natives. We can look it up. We can find. Uh, it. That's going to drive me crazy now because I love that book too. Where it takes place in Florida, yeah, yeah. and the kid that lives under the causeway. Yeah. Well, what is that book? Which oof. okay, somebody's going to Lainey's going to look it up because my yes. brain shot, but. Um, Lainey, can you look it up from, I'm looking it up too, but yeah. it's, um, oh my God. Um, you said rule of- uh, Lost memory, memory of skin. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, right. It's lost memory of skin. Lost That's memory it. of skin, which was a title that kind of put me off when I yep. first read the title. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like the kind of book that I would read. Yeah. To read, but because it was Russell, I read it. Yep. And it just blew me away. Yep. Yep. That's a tough one, but it's so good. And then of course the sweet hair after is, Oh my gosh. Boy, oh boy. What a book for a book club. I mean, it's just, yeah. you it's know, a perfect, book, a perfect book club book. And the yeah. question that you want to start with two questions to start with, what is the significance of the title? You know, why is it called the sweet hair after? And the other question is why did Russell choose to write it in, in four voices? Yeah. You know, and what would the book be like if he had picked any one of those voices or if there were, a, if it were a third person narrator telling the story? Um, and that's the kind of questions I think are so interesting to talk and that, about. Right. And going back to, to the community wide read, that really uh, lent itself well to, you know, yeah. our new best friend, Anna Ferris and everybody else reading those, <laughs> those characters. And of course, the movie with, was it Nick Nolte, right? Yeah. yeah. And Adam McGoyan, he, yep. Yep. it was, a, oh, it's heavy Chevy, but boy, is it good. Yeah. Yeah. The movie was very true to the book, um, which I always like when that happens. Yeah. So rare. Yeah. Um, but um, I, uh, I, have we gotten to all of our questions, Essie, Lainey? I think so. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want, I would be remiss if I did not um uh mention the fabulous reviews that that the writers library uh received i uh i love that donna seaman from booklist who we love and is so brilliant uh gave this a starred review and uh says complete with lists of titles from each writer's inner library this is a zestfully elucidating and inspiring portal into the lives and thoughts of truly exceptional writers um, PW gave it a starred review and said, you bring, you and Jess Schwager bring boundless enthusiasm and curiosity to this eclectic and probing book of interviews. And lastly, I will say the book reporter says, and this was referring to the hardcover and now I will reference the paperback, is that the writer's library is a great concept that is wonderfully executed. It would make a great holiday gift for the literati in your life. Absolutely. Happy holidays. Yes to one and all ho 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 <laughs> but listen seriously now i mean it's it's just such it is a gift it's a gift that you've given to us and for any book lover in your life uh, this is it and this is just it's um uh, it's so rich and interesting and and intimate um and um i just love how these writers feel safe and trusted with you and Jeff no, uh, to reveal what they reveal, you know, not just the books, but lots of other things too in the pages of this book. So right. thank you for 
for writing it and for recording it. And uh, of course, that all of that information is available for you to um, everybody there to check out how you can get the audio if you haven't gotten it yet. And um, Nancy, I thank you so much. Um, and congratulations again on your award. No one better to receive that award. You've done such great things for readers and writers and librarians and we love you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be on the show with you guys. Um, anytime. Love you all. It's an honor. Take good care. Bye-bye. Bye. And goodbye, everyone. And thank you so much for watching. We'll be back next week with two debuts that you're not going to want to miss. So keep your eyes peeled. Lainey, Essie, we're peacing out. Bye, everyone. Bye, Nancy. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone.